Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CEC on this beautiful sunny day. It is so wonderful to see all of you here and everyone at home. Welcome to church. I do have a few announcements about things that are coming up. Uh, one reminder is that next weekend is daylight savings time, so we get to spring forward. We do lose an hour of sleep, which is tough for all of us parents, but there's more sunlight in the day, and more light is always good. So remind, remember to turn your clocks forward next weekend. Also, I want to make an announcement about the Real Women's Ministry. There are applications on the welcome table if you're interested in this amazing mentoring program. And there's also information on the CEC website under Women's Ministry and also on the CEC Women's Facebook page. So if you're interested in being part of this mentoring program, please um, ask the staff for more information or look for information online or, or fill out an application. Also coming up is uh, the softball team is getting together again. Doug Shuey is the coach this year, and he's looking to fill a team. So there will be signups coming soon. If you are interested in being a part of that team, uh, you can reach out to anyone in the church staff for more information, or if you know Doug Shuey, you can talk directly to him. So play ball. Let's not forget, too, while it's fun to play softball, this is a really unique way to minister to other teams in the local area and bring Jesus Christ to, to, um, to people who don't know him. So please consider getting involved there. And one more really exciting announcement is that the nursery will be open next weekend. Um, so if you know people who have very young children under the age of three, um, please reach out to um, Daniel or Pam Deal. We are going to have a limited number of slots available each week to start. So you want to make sure if you're going to be bringing small children to the nursery. Um, and that will be just the 1030 service, probably. So... That might not, not apply to, to many of you, but um, if you know anyone who's interested, please tell them to reach out to Daniel or Pam Deal for information on that, okay? So will you all stand and join with me in our corporate prayer this morning? Wonderful. Let's lift our voices to God. Mighty God, everything you do reveals your glory and majesty. Open our eyes to see what you are doing in our lives. Let us marvel at your good gifts and your wise provision. Your acts are amazing, Lord. We cannot comprehend the number of blessings you pour out on us from day to day. As we gather today, we pray that you would transform us, Lord, and make us more like you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barbie, and good morning. We're giving Dave a much deserved and well deserved break this morning. Uh, the bad news is you won't hear his wonderful voice, the other bad news is you won't hear his trombone. The good news is you won't hear my trumpet, which my wife very appropriately told me, you haven't played in years, so, so uh, maybe sometime down the road. But it, we're all standing, so we'll join in. Uh, hymn number 199, God Our Father, We Adore Thee.
Holy Spirit, we adore Thee, Paraclete and Heavenly Guest, sent from God and from the Savior, Thou hast led us into I'll start again. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 18, verses 1 through 12. Unfriendly people care only about themselves. They lash out at common sense. Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. Doing wrong leads to disgrace, and scandalous behavior brings contempt. Wise words are like deep waters. Wisdom flows from the wise like a bubbling brook. It is not right to acquit the guilty or deny justice to the innocent. Fools' words get them into constant quarrels. They are asking for a beating. The mouths of fools are like their ruin, are their ruin. They trap themselves with their lips. Rumors are dainty morsels that sink deep into one's heart. A lazy person is as bad as someone who destroys things. The name of the Lord is a strong fortress. The godly run into him and are safe. The rich think of their wealth as a strong defense. They imagine it to be a high wall of safety. Haughtiness goes before destruction. Humility precedes honor. May the Lord continue to add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Janice. <clears throat> Our next hymn is number 248, There Shall Be Showers of Blessing. shall be showers of blessing this is a promise of love there shall be seasons refreshing sent from the savior above showers of blessing showers of blessing we need Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, 
righteous reviving again over the hills and the valleys sound of abundance of rain showers of blessing showers of blessing are near mercy drops round us are falling but for the showers we plead there shall be showers of blessing send them upon us O Lord grant us to now our refreshing come and now honor thy word showers of blessing showers of blessing we need mercy drops round us are falling but for the showers we plead there shall be showers of blessing oh that today they might fall now as to god we're confessing now as on jesus we call showers of blessing showers of blessing we need mercy drops round us are falling but for the showers we Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to gather as the people of God. We know, God, that where one or more are gathered together, you are there in our presence. So, Father, whether or not we are here physically in this building or whether we are at home gathered around family or friends, we know, God, that you are present there. So thank you, Lord, for that privilege of gathering with you we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will lead us and guide us through our day, and not just this day, but those to follow and to come tomorrow and the next. Father, that we might honor you as our Father, that we might bring joy to you as our God and as our Savior. Help us, Lord, to face every challenge with joy in our hearts, knowing that Our constitution, our hope is not in people, but our hope is truly in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So thank you, Lord, that no matter what happens, our hope cannot be taken from us because we have our hope in you. Lord, thank you for watching over our sister Pam Grossnickel. I know that she had a terrible spill a couple weeks ago at work, suffered a concussion. We just ask God that you will bring her through this time quickly. We thank you, Jesus, that that she wasn't harmed in any greater way than she was. We pray, Lord, that you will heal her from that whiplash and from that concussion. We pray for George, her husband, as he ministers to her and serves her, that he will do that with joy in his heart. May she know how much she is loved as a daughter of God. Father, we also want to pray for Pamela Widener's sister, who's undergoing cancer treatments for, for breast cancer. And we just ask, Father, that you will help her through the difficulty that she's been experiencing with some challenges we pray for healing for her body lord we pray that her eyes will be on you so do something great in her life we pray lord we want to also pray for olivia mcgawkey who's just having just a really rough time again we just ask you lord to encourage her today thank you for the way you love her thank you for the way that you care for her i pray lord that her eyes will be open to see you at work in her life regardless of her physical situation Father, for Gail Dobbins, our dear sister, we pray too, Jesus, that you will continue to draw close to her. I know that she has a heart for you and that she loves you so greatly. So, Father, just surround her with comfort today and with joy. May she know that she is loved by you and by us. 
Lord, we want to thank you for bringing Charlotte Roland home to her family. Thank you for the way you've worked through this situation and for the way you showed up and helped her through those treatments and the surgeries she's had. And we pray, God, that she will be safe. Lord, now as she continues on, that you will restore those things that have been taken from her. I pray, Lord, that you are just eradicating that cancer in her body. I pray for good days for her and her family, that they will appreciate this time that they can spend together. Father, we want to also pray for Joy Reber. Thank you for helping her through the surgery that she had a couple of weeks ago. We ask God for a quick recovery, and that you will just restore her body, that the surgery will have been successful for her. We also want to lift up our sister Paula Eckenroth, who's going into surgery on Tuesday. Just ask, Lord, that you will remind Paula that you are there with her. We pray for her surgeons, those who will be attending in the surgery. Lord, that you will guide their hands. We pray for a successful recovery for Paula and that it will be swift. We just surround her with your love and those who love her. Father, we pray for Mary and Johnson's daughter, Carol, who's having surgery tomorrow. We just pray, oh God, that that will be a success for her as well. We pray that she'll be safe through the surgery and afterward be with Marion. May she be a, just a source of encouragement and comfort to her daughter and their family at this time. Father, we read today that we can run into you and be safe. Lord Jesus, what a, what a beautiful, beautiful sentiment. So Lord, thank you that you remind us of these things that are in the scripture, that it is true, it is faithful, that you are good, that you are kind, that you are powerful. And Lord, that you are safe, mighty and fierce, but you are safe. So Jesus, may we put our trust and our faith in you this week. Father, we want to hear from you this morning. As Pastor Mike comes and brings your word, I pray, God, that your spirit will just invade him and just surround him, God, that he will speak only what you have for us to hear today. So, Father, may we be receptive to that word. May it encourage us, may it challenge us. May it cause us to repent, God, because we want to be more like you, Jesus. We pray these things in your blessed name. Amen. Thanks, Tim, for leading us in prayer this morning. And as he said, we are going to, uh, we're going to continue our series in the book of Daniel. I have uh, I thoroughly enjoyed Daniel as we've walked through um, these passages and looking at these stories. And, and again, uh, just a reminder, you know, the first half of Daniel is these very uh, interesting, very practical, uh, very easily, easily applicable uh, stories from the life of Daniel. And then when we get into the second half of Daniel, we're going to find ourselves sinking into some, uh, some real prophetic uh, pieces of Scripture, which talk about um, the end of times. And so uh, it's kind of two books smashed into one uh, that are super exciting, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, let's pray and ask God to speak to us here this morning. Lord God, as we open your word, uh, we do pray that you would speak to us. Lord, I pray that the things that I have prepared, that you would um, take the, the things that are of you and that you would communicate them deeply to our hearts. The things that are not of you, would you cause them to fall on deaf ears? God, I pray that my heart would be surrendered in this moment to allow you to speak. So we give this time to you, asking that, God, you would move in our hearts and in our lives and in our church. God, do something that would bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's dive right in. The main point, God hates pride. What we're going to talk about today, without apology, without mincing words, we're going to talk about pride. It's what, it's what the whole story in Daniel chapter 4 is about, is pride. We can go scripture to scripture that sees the depths of God's hatred for pride. Proverbs 16 Verse 5, the Lord detests the proud. They will surely be punished. Proverbs 8, verse 13, 
all who fear the Lord will hate evil. Therefore, I hate pride and arrogance. All who fear the Lord hate evil. Therefore, I hate pride and arrogance, corruption, and perverse speech. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before the fall. Proverbs 18, haughtiness goes before destruction. Humility precedes honor. And I love Isaiah 2. Human pride will be humbled. Human arrogance will be brought down. Only the Lord will be exalted on the day of judgment. We could do this for a long time, reading scripture after scripture after scripture that speak very clearly to God's detest of the sin of pride. I was uh, reading this week and I came across uh, a quote by um, C.S. Lewis and another quote by John Edwards, um, both famous um, evangelists, famous theologians who speak on the issue of pride. Lewis says this, there is one vice of which no man in the world is free. Speaking about how we all struggle on some level with the issue of pride which everyone loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine that they themselves are guilty. We all see other people who are prideful, but we don't see it in ourselves. But frankly, we are all guilty of pride. He goes on and says, I've heard people admit that they are bad-tempered, or that they cannot keep their heads about girls or drink, or even that they are cowards. I do not think I've ever heard anyone who was not a Christian accuse himself of this vice. And at the same time, I have very seldom met anyone who was not a Christian who showed the slightest mercy to it in others. There is no fault that makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we can more unco- be, uh, which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. And the more we have it in ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. I love that end statement there. Uh, If you've ever noticed, pride is one of those things that the more pride you have in yourself, you see it in others. You tend to think if you're a prideful person that everybody around you is prideful. Pride causes us to be selfish. Selfish people think everybody else is selfish. Lewis goes on and he says this, The vice I'm talking about is pride or self-conceit. The virtue opposite to it in Christian morals is called humility. According to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the most evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere fee- flea-, flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is complete anti-God in its state of mind. Lewis helps us understand that pride is at its core the most evil. Why? Because pride in itself says I am greater. It thinks higher of self. It puts self here. And in doing so, it tends to push God down. Pride then there then is the worship of self. It is making an idol. It is making a God out of myself. And so by its very nature would be the thing that God would hate most. Jonathan Edwards says, The first and worst cause of errors that prevail in such a state of things is spiritual pride. This is the main door by which the devil comes into the hearts of those who are are zealous for the advancement of religion. Tis the chief inlet of the smoke from the bottomless pit to darken the mind and mislead the judgment. This is the main handle by which the devil has hold of religious people and the chief source of all mischief that he introduces to clog and hinder the work of God. This cause of error is the mainspring or at least the main support of all the rest. Till the disease is cured, Medicines are in vain applied to to heal 
all other diseases. And so author after author, both biblical authors throughout Scripture and, and people who write on the, on, on the commentary on Scripture would tell us repeatedly that pride is such a deceitful, such an insidious, such a terrible sin. It is ranked as the greatest of sins. And so we dive into this story of Nebuchadnezzar again in uh, Daniel chapter 4, and we discover Nebuchadnezzar's sin of pride. Starts out early on in chapter 4, and uh, things are actually looking pretty good. We start out thinking, all right, Nebuchadnezzar's learned. If you remember chapter 3 last week, um, he's thrown uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the, into the fiery furnace, and, and, and they live through that. And he sees the, the fourth person walking with them. And as they come out, he makes this grand statement about how nobody should ever speak a word against the, the God of the Hebrews. And we get into chapter 4, and it says, King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Nebuchadnezzar does in that day what is the equivalent of the President of the United States having a press conference, a big press conference, where everybody tunes in, where everybody's eyes are on it, all around the world. He wants everyone to hear this. He is the world's most significant leader, and so everybody is listening. And he says this, peace and prosperity to you. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Like, good for you, Nebuchadnezzar. You have finally, like, turned to God. He's made, like, this grand growth point in his life. Like, things are good. Here's this godly man, Nebuchadnezzar. He goes on and says, How great are his signs. How powerful are his wonders. His kingdom will last forever. His rule through all generations. It sounds wonderful, but as we read the rest of the story, what we're going to discover is that this appears to be just an act. It appears to be Nebuchadnezzar thinking this is what he ought to do, and so he's kind of putting on an act, or he's in the process of, of kind of discovering who God is, but the, the truth, the heart of who God is has not sunken into Nebuchadnezzar's heart. And God is going to reveal through this story the true heart of Nebuchadnezzar. So it goes on and um, it tells us in the next few verses that he has another dream. Um, I, I, I would think at this point Nebuchadnezzar would start to get a little bit concerned about his dreams because they don't go well for him. So he's having this another dream and this time he dreams of um, this huge tree that's in the center of the earth. And this huge tree has long branches and it has fruit all over it. And there's all of these animals that live underneath it. And the fruit from the tree feed the entire world. And the, and the branches give comfort and peace to the entire world. And there's birds that live in it. This tree is wonderful. But all of a sudden, in the midst of this dream, he sees a being come down from heaven, and the being destroys the tree. He cuts it down. He strips all the leaves. He scatters all the fruit. He scatters all of the animals. And Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know what to do with this. And so like we saw in chapter 2, immediately he calls out to all of his advisors. He's saying, somebody, please tell me what my dream means. I'm confused. I don't understand. It doesn't make sense to me. And of course, none of them know the, the answer. We would think that maybe he would have learned a lesson because in chapter 2, nobody knew, and he finally calls in Daniel. So finally, he calls in Daniel. And Daniel comes, and he's talking to him, and he's, um, and he's, and he's explaining to him what's going on. And, uh, and, and he says to him, um, Hey, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, I'm a little concerned. In verse 19, it says this uh, of chapter 4. Um, it says, Upon hearing this, upon hearing the dream, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, was overcome for a time, frightened by the meaning of the dream. And then the king said to him, Belteshazzar, don't be alarmed by the dream and what it means. Belteshazzar replied, I wish the, or Belteshazzar 
replied, I wish the events foreshadowed in the dream would have happened to your enemies, my Lord, and not to you. So Daniel hears of the dream, he hears what happens, and immediately he's struck in with terror because he knows, once again, he's about to give this almighty king terrible news. He's about to say to him, like, things are not good. Daniel wanted to be the guy who called in, was called in to the, to the grand leader um, who gave him all the news he wanted to hear. Like, don't we love having those advisors in our lives? The people were like, dude, you're awesome. Don't worry about it. It's all good. None of us really like to have the guy who comes in and says, uh, we need to talk about this. I'm seeing a problem here. I need to have a, I need to have a heart-to-heart honest conversation. And Daniel's afraid that in having this heart-to-heart conversation with the king, he's going to be in trouble. He's going to get fired. He's going to get kicked out of his office. Worse yet, he's probably going to be killed for being honest with the king. And so here's King Nebuchadnezzar. He says, no, Daniel, go ahead, tell me like it is. And so Daniel says, well, here's the thing. What's going to happen is... um, What this dream is saying is that you probably, not well, not probably, is you, uh, as the king, you're the tree. And your nation is about to be cut down. Your kingdom, your reach of influence is going to be cut down. You're going to be taken from your position of power. As the tree is cut down, we read of this band that's put around the tree, and the roots stay in the ground. And Daniel says to him, you're going to live as a wild animal. Your human mind is going to be taken from you. And you're going to live as a wild animal. You're going to eat grass like a, like a cattle would eat grass. And, and you're going to grow long hair and long nails. And you're going, to, you're going to function like a wild animal for a period of time. It says seven periods of time. Again, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not um, that seven periods of time is seven days, seven weeks, seven months, seven years. We don't know exactly how long it is. Most people do believe, though, that it is, that it is representative, again, of the time of perfection, the number of perfection, that King Nebuchadnezzar is going to experience this existence long enough to understand his sin of pride understand who he is. He's going to go into this terrible time. God's going to do exactly what he needs to do to finally get his attention. But I love how Daniel um, kind of reveals this dream. And when he gets to the end, Daniel shows the heart of God. Like God's heart is always patient. It's always graceful. He's always giving us another chance, saying, look, would you wake up and turn your heart back to me? In verse 27, Daniel says, at the end of his explanation of this dream, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past. Be merciful to the poor. And perhaps you will continue to prosper. This king has made this grand display to the world about, look at my faith, look at my religion. And Daniel has to confront him and say, I know it's just an act. Would you turn away from it? Would you please, O king, turn your heart to God? But we read in verse 28 that he doesn't. It said, God gives him actually a year. Verse 28 says, but all these things did happen to the king, did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he was taking a walk on the flat roof of his royal palace in Babylon. And as he looked out across the city, this is where the sin of the king is exposed. This is where we see the heart of the king. This is where we see God's, what really made God angry with King Nebuchadnezzar. He says he he, he walked on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. And as he looked across the city, he said, Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic 
splendor. He had put on this display about the great works of God, who God was, and how much he believed in him, but his heart is revealed here where he says, I'm so awesome. Look how great I have made Babylon. All praise to me. And it says there in verse 3, or excuse me, in verse 31, while these words were still in his mouth. As he's making this statement about his own glory, his own greatness, a voice came down from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You will be driven from human society, and you will live in the fields with the wild animals, and you will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over all the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. Nebuchadnezzar is stripped of his power. He's stripped of his greatness. He's stripped of his authority. And he's forced to bow his knee to the true king of all creation. James chapter 4 talks about God's desire that we would be a people that our hearts truly would be bowed to God and God alone. James reflects in the New Testament the heart that God is looking for from Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, and he gives grace generously, as the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God had come to Nebuchadnezzar. He had given him chance after chance after chance. And Nebuchadnezzar continued to commit this great sin of pride. And he says, so humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be a sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. See, God's desire is that we would have a heart that's broken before him. That we would have hearts that don't just put on some kind of humble act and say, you know, look how, you know, look how great God is. But deep inside, we're like, you know, we're pretty awesome. Look at what we've built. Look at what we've accomplished. Look at who we are. Look at what a great people we are. Look at all that we have done. God says, it's not what I want. And he says, you will be humbled. One way or another, we will be humbled. We can choose to do so, as Jane says, humble yourselves before the Lord, or we can be like Nebuchadnezzar and say, you know what, God, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and humble you instead. Because God will, in the end, have all of our knees bowed at his feet, in his feet alone. And so he comes to Nebuchadnezzar and he forces him into this horrible existence. That is the complete opposite of pride. Eating grass, behaving like an animal, long nails that look like claws of a, of a bird, hair that's grown wild that looks like feathers. I can't imagine what he looked like, but he surely did not look like the great king that he wanted himself to be. And so God said, I will humble you. I love how chapter 4 ends. Because guess what? When God wants somebody to bow at his feet, he will cause it to happen. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar does. Nebuchadnezzar ends up at the feet of God. This is the last we're going to hear of him. We're in chapter 5 going to move on to his son. But at the end of chapter 4, we read these words. After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven, and my sanity returned. And I praised and worshipped the Most High. And I honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting. His kingdom is eternal. Notice he has stopped taking credit for his own kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar has stopped taking credit for what he's accomplished, for who he is, for his own greatness, for his own glory. He has stopped drawing any attention to himself. And he says all glory and honor and attention goes to God and God alone. 
His rule is everlasting. His kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to Him. He does as He pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop Him or say to Him, what do you mean by doing these things? When my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory in kingdom. And my advisors and nobles sought me out. And I was restored as head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heavens all his acts are just and true and he is able to humble the proud see god's heart is always that he would receive all glory and honor And when we find ourselves and we find people around us and we find our culture, when we find our nation, when we find our world living in this place of seeking glory for itself, saying, look at who we are, look at what we have done, Galatians 6 becomes a reality. Galatians 6, God says this, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. And those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. God hates pride. God hates pride. God hates pride. And we've allowed ourselves to fall into this complacent attitude that puts on some kind of false humility and we live in a world that is drenched in pride. And God hates it. And if we're going to be a people who are going to make a difference in this world around us, if we're going to see any kind of change in our world, any kind of change in our, in our nation, any kind of change in our state, in our county, in our church, we've got to address the pride that is at our hearts. We've got to be in a place of brokenness, in a place of genuine humility. We've got to be willing to admit that I struggle with pride. And frankly, I do. And so for the rest of the the next 10 to 12 minutes as we kind of wrap up, I'd I'd like us to just take some really super practical steps to deal with pride in our lives. I ran across a a website that was put out by uh, Bethany Global University. If I'm being completely honest, I don't know anything about Bethany Global University. I am not recommending them to you. I'm not telling you go read the things they say uh, or do. Um, But their one website dealing with pride, their one blog post dealing with pride, I thought was excellent. And so I borrowed their material on how to identify and address pride in our own heart. How do we know we're prideful people? Prideful people frequently put uh, all of the attention on themselves. They look to gain attention. They look to gather attention to themselves. Prideful people struggle to emphasize, em, uh, empathize with the sorrows of others. Are you somebody who struggles to see when somebody else is hurting, to really empathize with them? Could be an issue of pride in your heart. Feeling self-pity when you're not praised. When somebody doesn't say, hey, you did a good job. Somebody who's truly humble doesn't care about getting credit or getting glory or being thanked. Constantly considering what others think of you. A prideful person is always worried about what other people think. A prideful person is, uh, avoids people who are better than them at something because they always want to be the best. They always want to look the best. They always want to sound the best. And if somebody else is better than them, they don't go near them because then they'll be exposed for who they really are. They easily find flaws in others. So there's some of the simple ways to start to identify pride in ourselves. You know, the truth is we all have a a bit of pride that we need to deal with, but some of us have even more than others. 
And so this uh, website gave 10 steps. So I'm going to give you 10 things you can do to identify and deal with pride. The first thing that it talked about was identifying the lies you believe. See, the enemy knows that pride is one of the greatest way. It's the way that he opens us up to all other sin in our lives. And so he's going to tell us lies. We know that the enemy is a liar and he's the father of lies. And so one of the greatest ways to draw us into pridefulness is by lying to us. Telling us that God isn't really concerned about the things we do. God's not really going to punish you. When was the last time you were really punished for doing that? My sin is really not that serious. Nobody really cares. You're not hurting anybody. You deserve to be thanked for that. They, they're being neglectful by not thanking you. You should get more credit for this. These lies that we're being told, as we start to recognize them, they draw us into pridefulness. They draw us into wanting credit for ourselves. We're saying, I'm... I'm humble enough. You're a pretty humble guy. Mike's full of it this morning. Don't listen to him. You got, you got humility covered. You're not a prideful person. He's talking about somebody else. These are all lies the enemy would tell us. Psalm 10 reveals these lies. The wicked are too proud to seek God. They seem to think that God is dead. Yet they succeed in everything they do. They don't see your punishment awaiting them. They sneer at all of their enemies. They think nothing bad will ever happen to us and we will be free of trouble forever. This is from the beginning of time. We've dealt with these lies that the enemy tells us. It's all okay. It's really not that bad. And they start to draw us into pride. The second thing we can do to address pride in our hearts is to come to a place of true understanding of who God is. God is holy. God's wisdom is infinite. His glory is never ending. His goodness is unsearchable. Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and I not, will not give my glory or, to another or my praise to idols. John 3, we must, John the Baptist said, I, he must increase, I must decrease. Coming to a place of, of, of understanding pride in our hearts and, and defeating it is recognizing who God is. Recognizing, truly bowing our hearts to His glory, His greatness. His majesty, His rule, His perfection, His infinite wisdom, and recognizing our complete lack of on the other side. I've had people say, well, isn't it okay to take pride in a job well done? Isn't it okay to take pride in accomplishments? That's a really fine line. I've heard preachers say, yeah, it is okay. I would suggest that it's okay granting me success in this. God, thank you for giving me the ability to accomplish this. God, thank you. It is giving God the glory, God the credit, God the acknowledgement because it is Him and Him alone who's accomplishing this. C.S. Lewis said this, a proud man is always looking down on things and people and of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something above you. Defeating pride means looking up and seeing up. The third thing we can do is understand ourselves, understand our brokenness, understand who we truly are. Ephesians 2 describes to us that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Romans 3 says all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Isaiah says our righteousness, our goodness, the things that we might want to take pride in, compared to God is filthy rags. We've got to recognize who we truly are. And that'll, that'll kind of strip us of pride pretty quickly. Blaise Pascal back in the 1600s said, do, do you want people to think well of you? 
then don't speak well of yourself. Number four, consider others as more important than you. Philippians 2, Paul says, don't do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Jesus said, he who wants to be first must be the servant of all. When we're looking to have a heart of service, when we're looking to have a heart that's constantly wanting to put others first, wanting to serve others, wanting to make others better, we find ourselves dealing with the sin of pride in our hearts and lives. Number five, receive compliments well. Man, this is such a hard one. Such a hard one. But often I think we allow ourselves to kind of um, kind of grow our own pride when somebody compliments us. This is something, honestly, most pastors struggle with. Great sermon this morning, Mike. No, it's really don't say don't say that. Come on, it was it was fine. Keep going. It was really awesome. No, it just. You got any more to say? You know, and 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 we're like, no, it's just, and we put on this false humility. And it not just pastors, but we do it in all kinds of areas of our lives because we don't know how to say thank you. To God be the glory. I'm so glad he used this sermon this morning. I'm so glad he gave me the opportunity to bless you. I'm so glad he's gifted me with this. It is, it is taking a compliment well and giving God the glory. Not in a false way, but in a genuine way. Number six, remind yourself of Christ's example. I love Philippians 2, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, which speaks about the humility of Christ. Let yourself have the same attitude that is that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And it goes on and talks about how he took upon himself, God himself, the Son of God himself, takes on the form of a servant, takes on the lowest position, and submits himself to death. Willingly, voluntarily, intentionally takes on the form of a servant. And Philippians 2 goes on and it says, Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor, in his humility given the highest honor, and gave him the name that is above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus willingly humbled himself and God glorified him. Nebuchadnezzar willingly glorified himself and God humbled him. Number seven, ask, oh, this is a hard one. Ask God to humble you. Understand, recognize, and admit that you have a pride problem. And say, God, would you humble me? Would you work humility into my heart? My prayer for you and for me is that we don't end up in Nebuchadnezzar's position before we learn genuine humility. But God grants all good requests. And what greater request than saying, God, take the pride out of my heart and give me genuine humility. Number eight, flee false humility. We touched on this just a moment ago. William Law said, you can have no greater sign of confirmed pride than when you think you are humble enough. I'll never forget when I was a kid, I grew up in the church, and I remember um, we used to have uh, once a quarter, we'd have a missionary come in, and we would cancel all the Sunday school classes, and everybody would be in the sanctuary, and the missionary would speak. And for this one Sunday school class, the missionary stood up and, and he was talking about pride. And, and, and he said, um, I'm not going to do this to you because I don't want you to be embarrassed the way I was. He said, how many of you in this room think that you're humble? And I was probably 13 or 14. I was like, yep, I got this one. And I raised my hand high and proud. And he said, look around. Anyone whose hands up is probably the people who struggle with pride the most. And I was like, oh. Nope, 
I was just stretching my arm, you know. It's a, See, the reality is, when we think ourselves humble, when we boast about our humility, it's really some kind of false humility. Because genuine pride doesn't need, or genuine humility doesn't need any kind of recognition, any kind of glory, any kind of notice of its humility. Number nine, avoid positions that cause pride. If you are a person who truly struggles with pride, be aware of it and attack this thing intentionally, purposefully. When Paul is giving Timothy instructions for uh, leaders in the church, he says, don't put anyone into a position believer, lest that position that they're in somehow cause them to fall into the sin of pride. And so be very aware of your pride and don't seek after positions or accomplishments or things that might bolster your pride but willingly seeking after positions of servanthood. How can I serve? Where can I serve? What can I do? Yet you need people to hold babies in the 1030 service? I'll do that. I'll stick around after the 830 service and I'll hold babies once a month, twice a month, once a quarter. Why? Because I'll, I don't need any glory. I just want to serve. And finally, do what, be, what really, I mean, it's almost, it's almost sounds like a Sunday school answer, but it is the core answer to all of our sin problems. Go to God's Word. Meditate on God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We have aggressively, as a nation, attacked a pandemic in the last year, almost to the date. I don't think anything's going to get better through shots, through masks, through social distancing. Nothing's going to change in our country until we aggressively and intentionally attack the pandemic of pride that we have going on in this country. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Nebuchadnezzar. God, thank you for the way that you taught him an incredibly difficult lesson. And God, I see a lot of similarities between Nebuchadnezzar and the world we live in today. We've talked about the similarities between Babylon and the nation we live in today. God, I pray that you would give us the grace to allow you to teach us genuine humility before we have to face your actions to humble us. God, may we intentionally, purposefully, and aggressively deal with the pride that's in our hearts. For your honor and glory, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Let's stand for our closing hymn, number 351, O oh, for a Heart to Praise My God.
together. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your patience. God, thank you for the way you gave Nebuchadnezzar another 12 months to figure it out. And you've given us so much time to figure it out. God, today, I pray for each and every person in this room. God, I pray for my own heart. Help us to figure out the pride that eats us up. Helps to recognize who you truly are and to bow our knees solely to you. God, do a work in us. Do a powerful work in us. Mold us into your image, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Have a wonderful week.